We got married young and decided to put off starting a family for a while. To earn, save money, and see the world. We are ordinary people, not stunningly beautiful or homely or brilliant or stupid. My wife is a tall, slender woman whose grandparents came from southern Italy, with clear, swarthy skin, dark eyes, and black hair. She has full lips, big eyes, and a strong nose. She thinks the nose is terrible, but to me it speaks of a strong character. She has a natural grace in her walk and movements. I first saw her from across the room and fell in love before I even saw her face. As for making money, we are doing well. Thanks to rising real estate values, even in this lousy market, we have $100,000 to $150,000. Since we've been living together for a few years now, I only have two complaints. She's not as smart as I used to think she was, and she's stubborn as hell. She tends to make quick assessments, and even upon reflection, she sees that she's wrong and clings to her initial answer. Once she gets a thought into her head, I can bury it in persuasive arguments, get her to admit she was wrong, listen to her assert my point of view as her own, and only then, months later, does it rise from the grave. Every stupid thought that has ever popped into her head will probably stay that way and not leave her until her last breath. This is a serious problem as I value wit and intelligence above all else. My wife works for Bycatch Industries in Princeton, about 45 minutes from our house. Bycatch is fish, turtles, and the like that have been caught in fishing nets and are of no commercial value. So they are thrown overboard, mostly dead. They make up 70-80% of the catch, and their needless destruction is one of the many reasons why the oceans are depleting so quickly. We only take the fish we like and destroy the rest. Ironically, Bycatch doesn't actually have anything to do with fish or fishing. It's a Danish company that buys up all sorts of scrap metal and surplus goods and recycles or resells them. They are making good progress. Unlike many small European companies in the U.S., Americans are mostly in management positions. Buying and selling, negotiating and taking risks is what they do. My wife is a well-paid buyer-seller at this company, a senior product manager specializing in chemicals. For example, she buys scrap methanol from a chemical plant, contaminated with whatever, and sells it to, well, in this case, she sold it to a municipal wastewater treatment plant where contamination is not a problem. She works out of an unremarkable office in Princeton, New Jersey. I rarely have an excuse or desire to stop by her office, but just on Thanksgiving Day, I was driving by around 11.30 a.m. and thought I'd stop by and surprise the wifey. Take her out to lunch. I know quite a few of her co-workers from parties and such, so no one saw fit to announce me. I waved to those I knew, stopped to chat here and there, and went upstairs to her office. I poked my head through the open door of her office. Hello, my favorite. Do you have time for me? Chris, it's so good to see you. What a treat. On her desk was a bouquet of flowers in a cheap glass vase. I was passing by and wondered if you were free for lunch. Tell me, who gave you the flowers? Honestly, they were a few days old. But it was a nice bouquet. Probably seventy. Eighty dollars with shipping here. Maybe a little less where we live. And I thought it was you. The card said, From your secret admirer, no name. I wondered why you didn't say anything about them. When did they come? Uh, yesterday, I think. Then you didn't send them? You know perfectly well that I didn't. You would have told me so last night if you really thought I had sent them. Frankly, I'm disappointed that you accepted them. You're a married woman and should know better. When exactly did they come, before or after dinner? Nonsense, they're just flowers. Besides, I really thought you sent them. What do you care when they came? I think it was after lunch, maybe three o'clock in the afternoon. Look, if you really thought I sent them, you would have been in a loving mood last night. You didn't say anything, and you behaved in a way that is, unfortunately, quite normal for us. So if I didn't send them, who do you think did? Oh, I have no idea. It could have been anyone. Nonsense, let's think about it. Your admirer has to be either a man or a woman. Those are the only options, aren't they? No woman has ever given me flowers in my life, so we can conclude they're from a man. Oh, with a puzzled look. 
Right. Probably not from a woman. Presumably he sent them for a reason. He's a secret admirer of yours. Which of your fine qualities do you think he admires? How should I know? I don't know. Give me a break, Karen. What do men usually think of when they send a woman flowers? Romance? Bingo. Women think about romance. Men think of fun. So, your admirer suspects you're a ripe fruit. Perhaps an insider. Someone outside the company, a supplier or customer, can hit on you without complications. No one will spend $70, $80 unless they are encouraged, unless they expect you to be receptive. So this guy is someone who has been flirting with you and thinks you're open to their suit, pun not intended, but didn't want to immediately say, Karen, let's have fun. You're so rude. I'm sure it's not like that at all. Honestly, men. Let me finish. You had two choices. Accept the flowers and the spirit in which they were given and thus encourage him to continue. Or reject them and the guy by giving them to someone else or sticking them in the coffee corner and telling everyone in the office and me when you got home that whoever this secret admirer was, he was a fool and barking up the wrong tree. Furthermore, it was probably someone who was here yesterday afternoon or today because they'd like to see your reaction to them. You know, to see if the fish had swallowed the bait. Which you did. So, who fits that description? If you're free for lunch, we can talk about it. Oh, sure. I had plans, but that's okay. I'll cancel them. Let me make the call first. I told you I don't know anyone who thinks that way about me. Okay, but you don't have to cancel your plans, really. I wouldn't mind going to lunch with your co-workers. She picked up the phone, telling me, It would be a much greater pleasure to have lunch with you. And into the phone. Hello, listen. Chris stopped by to take me to lunch, so I have a better offer. Another time? My husband, Chris. Okay, see you later. Who was that? Oh, just Roland St. Clair. He works in one of the other offices, comes to Princeton once or twice a month. I'll meet him some other time. You're right about the flowers. I hadn't even thought of that. She took them in her hands, and as we walked through the office, said a little louder than necessary. I really thought these were from you. And rather abruptly tossed them with a loud clang into the trash can. As we walked toward the parking lot, I asked, Oh, does Roland fit the profile? Who, him? No, he's just a guy I work with. Nothing special about him. Why do you talk about him like that? It doesn't matter, my love. She knew who sent them, but I wasn't about to pry her name out, so I left it at that. We had a lovely lunch. She was very touching, trying to assure me that we were a couple. For whatever reason, guilt, reassurance, or pre-menstrual attraction, a good time was had by all that night. About three weeks later, at a Christmas party at Beecotch, Karen walked around in a circle while I exchanged phrases with Natalie Waski and Julie Sullivan, her co-workers. We were people watching when a cougar walked through the door. I noticed this guy as soon as he entered the room. He threw his coat on a chair and, after a quick look around the room, headed to the far end of the room toward a group of three women, one of whom was my wife. Karen noticed his approach, and out of the corner of my eye I saw her glance at me. The kitty hound immediately began chatting with her, to the noticeable annoyance of the other two women. He touched her lightly, first on the shoulder, then the top of her arm, not lewdly or anything, but quite familiar. Too familiar, I thought. Though she didn't really react, she put her hand on his arm a few times. I asked, Who is this guy talking to my wife? You can almost see him drooling. They glanced over. Natalie snorted with mild disdain. That's Roland St. Clair. He's the type. He's not in the Wilmington office, but he comes here every week or two and wastes our time. He spends half the day bragging and flirting, making innuendos and wise remarks. This idiot has been reported for harassment two or three times. Rumor has it that his sister is married to Sven Cedarquist, so they keep covering for him. What an abomination. We can always see him coming because he has a shiny yellow Humvee. What an idiot. We all laughed. He sounds like a wimp to me. I'd better chase him away before my wife reports him. Karen's buddies scattered, either to avoid Roland or perhaps realizing they weren't expected. 
When I approached the two of them, my wife was standing with her back to me. I ran my hand over her neck and shoulder in a deliberately possessive gesture. She pulled her hand away from Roland's wrist. She was guilty of bad thoughts, no doubt. My right hand was by my wife's side, but I defiantly didn't offer her a handshake. Hi, I'm Chris, Karen's husband. And who are you? Oh, don't you know Roland? Chris, this is Roland St. Clair. He works in accounting in the Wilmington office. Nice to meet you, I'm sure, Roland said. He started to extend his hand, but realized that would be silly and yanked it away. I don't think Karen noticed that. Do you work with Karen? I mean, do you do bookkeeping on her accounts and such? Oh no, my work has nothing to do with Roland, Karen whispered hastily. We both like the Flyers hockey team. I guess Roland can answer for himself. So you have nothing to do with Karen in terms of business? Hmm. It was news to me that she's interested in hockey. As far as I know, she's never watched a game in her life. About work, Karen's right, but I'm a big Flyers fan. Never miss a game, said Hound. So, Roland, is your wife here? I'd like to meet her. Maybe the four of us can go to a Flyers game. Karen and I have never been, and it would be good for us to go with people who really know the game. Should be fun. My wife looked at me incredulously. My suggestion didn't resonate. No, Sandra can't come. The Flyers game would be great, but she hates sports, just like Karen says you do. Frankly, Karen and I would rather go and leave you and Sandra at home. My wife smiled. That's not a plan. Karen and I have been married long enough for me to realize that it's important to separate activities. I played hockey in high school, so at least I know the game, but I never followed sports corporations. I always figured that if I was going to root for a corporation, I'd better root for one in which I had stock. However, rhetoric aside, I would love to watch the game, especially since, according to you, Karen is enthusiastic. I don't mind at all. If, uh, Sandra, huh? doesn't like hockey, what do you two like to do together? Wifey's long face. She doesn't think I'm doing well here. Chris, Roland, and his wife. I squeezed her shoulder lightly, but she ignored my signal. A little tense with each other right now. Oh, I'm truly sorry to hear that, Roland. Would you mind telling me what happened? Chris, it's none of our business, is it? Do you always answer for Roland? It's annoying. How am I supposed to know how Roland feels if you're always interrupting him? But since you knew about it, it means Roland thinks it's your business. And since married people have few secrets, it's my business now. I mean, why did you bring it up if you and he won't talk about it? Oh, really? Why are you being so rude? Roland, let me pour a couple drinks into him and we'll talk later. She actually dragged me by the sleeve to the bar and ordered drinks for us. Hmm. She was on a roll. Apparently, I had provoked her more than I expected. Okay, so what's the cause of Roland's problems with his wife? Is he running around on her? Chris, I can't talk about them. It's confidential. Roland certainly doesn't want his marital troubles spreading around the workplace, does he? Roland is going through a tough time, and I'm just a friend and supportive of him. Karen, I can understand that this may not be the time or place to talk about it here in this crowd. But if you think I'm immodest or can't keep a secret, then you really don't know the man you married. It's not only reasonable, but right that you should share with me what another man tells you about his intimate relationship. First, you are not a marriage counselor, and often such stories serve to lower the barrier between right and wrong relationships. Second, you will be tempted to respond in kind and tell him about your marital difficulties. That's fine if you're talking to a good friend who has no interest in your marriage someone who clearly has your best interests at heart. I assume you have begun to have Roland's best interests at heart and want to reconcile Roland with his wife. Unfortunately, sympathizing with Roland and comforting a man in pain is a short-lived endeavor. I think he's trying to drive a wedge between us, to divide us in order to get you. His comments and advice are not in your best interest. And finally, I'm a man, and I can give you a man's point of view on this. I would be reassured if you could tell me openly about your relationship with Roland that your support wouldn't go too far. What are you accusing me of, huh? Come on, spill it out. Do you think I'm having fun with him? Is that so?
No, it isn't. You've been on my case all evening. What's the matter with you? Guilty people run when no one is chasing them. She sucked in her drink like water. While I poured most of my drink into a half-empty beer glass, she scanned the crowd. It was a night to be cold sober. I'm not accusing you of having fun with him. I'm informing you of a threat to us. Look, let's talk about this later. Neither of us wants to get into a public brawl. Let's go dance, sweetheart. She finished her drink, and I swallowed the few drops left in mine before we stepped out onto the parquet. She wanted another drink, and as before, she drank hers quickly, and I took a few sips and spat out the rest. Back on the parquet, she softened as we did a slow dance, and I whispered affectionate words in her ear. The next dance was fast, which is not among my talents, but I held on. The second dance was fast, too. The next moment, Roland spun around beside me. I have to admit, he's a pretty good dancer. Gotta hand it to him, he's got brass balls. After a minute or so, he settled down across from me, and Karen began to follow suit. I walked over to Roland and dug my fingers in between his triceps muscle and bone hard enough that it would hurt and probably leave a bruise. I pulled him to me and spoke in his ear, quietly enough that Janetka couldn't hear, but the music made it too damn loud for him. Back off, asshole. You can cut in on the conversation with my wife when you're down on the floor with your own wife. Until then, stay the hell away from Karen. You send her flowers again, and I'll shove a vase up your ass. Got it? He stared at me, tense, like he was going to fight. Then he ducked his head and walked away. Karen guessed what I'd said and pounced on me with fists, starting to reprimand me for being so belligerent with poor Roland. I saw that the others had noticed this, so I took her hand firmly, no bruises, just a firm grip, and muttered in her ear. We need to talk somewhere where we won't make a scene in front of your co-workers. Smile when you go outside with your husband. And I walked her out to the parking lot. Poor Roland. He's so lonely. I'm just trying to be a friend to him. Help him and his wife get back together. You're so rude, Chris. You have no reason to be rude to Roland. Don't ever talk to me or treat me like that again. I'm not ten years old. Cut the crap. You're the blind man here. Let me tell you the way it is. Like that old song, he's none other than a hound dog peeping at my door. That's not the lyrics. It says, you're nothing but a hound dog that cries all the time. My mom was an Elvis fan and used to sing that song all the time. Besides, Roland has a right to be sad. I was quoting Eric Clapton's version. Everyone has the right to be sad. Look. Roland is digging around under your skirt, and you know why. His problems with his wife have to do with him having fun with other women, and I'm sure you're not the only one he's trying to hook up with. I reasoned, but I think I had his number. I'd prefer you stay away from him, but you work for the same company. You've both recognized that he has no business reason to visit you, so you don't have to spend your time entertaining him or going out to lunch with him. I understand he travels to your office in Princeton on a regular basis. He's having trouble finding a place to live, and he doesn't interfere with our marriage. Chris, I'm a grown man. You're not going to tell me who I can talk to. Karen, in all the years we've been dating and married, I've never given you direct orders, but I am now. Make up with him in public because you have to, but you must never, ever be alone outside of work. No lunches alone, no drinks after work, no car rides, no phone calls, no emails, no instant messaging. Do you understand? She started crying, devolving into sobs and rants. She wasn't speaking very coherently, and I wondered if it was the alcohol. As I was pulling out of the parking lot, she jumped to her feet and screamed, Wait, wait, there's my coat! Pull over! We have to go back! Your coat will be there tomorrow. You can pick it up then. Did you understand what I said a minute ago? Listen, damn it. You're going to drive me there, or else when we get home, I'm going to get in the car and drive here by myself. Okay. If you still want to go back to the party when we get home, I'll take you wherever you say. You're upset, barely conscious, and you've had a lot to drink. Roland is bad news. I love you and I'm not giving you up without a fight.
she sulked the rest of the way home. When the car stopped in the driveway, she jumped out of it, stormed into the house, headed straight upstairs, slammed and locked the bedroom door, and then threw herself on the bed. I heard a thump. I wondered if I had been too cruel. Now Roland was the victim, and forbidden fruit is sweet. There was no point in checking the home computer. They could have been texting and communicating all day on the work computers. I pondered the situation half the night. I wasn't going to give her up without a fight, but if I lost the fight, she would be out the door. I needed to gather credit card information and check them to find out what cards we had open. I needed to cancel joint cards. I needed to get a couple cards in my name. Go see a damn lawyer. At least I knew where the bank accounts were. Shit. 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 The next day, I went to the bedroom to get dressed and found the door unlocked. Karen was still asleep when I brushed my teeth, got dressed, and went to work. I have a friend named Grace Chung. She's in charge of the computer systems where I work as a technician. I brought her a cup of coffee and sat in the chair next to her desk. I moaned to her about Roland and my wife, asking what to do. Ha! Huh. It's been a thing, it's been a thing. About eight, ten months ago, I too thought my husband was leaving. Like you, I didn't have access to his email at work, and I had no idea who he might be sleeping with. I bought a transponder, or rather two, because he has a car and a truck. I could track where he was traveling by going online. I did this for three weeks. He seemed to drive aimlessly. What the hell, I thought. For my birthday, he gave me a beautiful antique vanity mirror. Turns out he'd been to all the antique stores. What an idiot I was. Grace, I think Roland is trying to antagonize me and get to her by selling her a heartwarming story. And I'm genuinely afraid my wife has fallen for it. Don't be silly. Karen seems like a nice person. Look. I've still got the transponders and software. Bring your laptop tomorrow. I'll load the software into it. You can take as many transponders as you want. Put one on Roland's car, one on your wife's, and you can track them wherever they go. It's simple. Well, Grace, that's the way forward, isn't it? Karen has a certain innocence and empathy, so it might be kind-hearted on her part, except for Roland. I can definitely smell the smoke. Innocent until proven guilty, right? Let's do it. After work, I stopped by a spy store and bought a clock radio with a built-in color camera and microphone that could broadcast within 500 feet. It even came with software to record the signal on a laptop and edit the audio video. I didn't really have a plan. I just figured pictures are worth a thousand words, and they would probably come in handy at some point. I also figured that if I had a problem with the program, Grace could fix it. I needn't have worried. I followed the instructions and it worked. The little camera transmitted the sound and image from the TV in my living room to a computer over 1,000 feet away. The image was a little grainy, but the sound was perfect. The next day, Grace programmed my computer to receive transponders. Everything looked great. She projected a small car on the map with restaurants, hotels, and other points of interest right around them with an accuracy of 20 yards. By clicking on Google Earth, I was able to see the area. I needed to know when Roland would be in the office, but the caller ID was bothering me. Since I have a distinctive voice, I asked a friend to call the Wilmington office of Bycatch Industries and ask the receptionist if Roland would be available mid or late afternoon. She was very concerned because he had an important meeting from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock, and he only had a half hour of free time before he had to meet with Fleming at 4.30. My friend said he would try to contact him another day. Well, good riddance. I left work at noon and drove to Wilmington. There was no security in the parking lot as far as I could tell. It's impossible not to notice the yellow Hummer. I wondered if he was driving down the street pretending to be a real man traveling to Fallujah, Iraq, dodging roadside bombs. I stuck the transponder where the direction said the signal would be best and found a hot wire to plug it in. Before pulling out of the parking lot, I checked the computer and yay. There goes the yellow tub icon. I headed home. In the evening, I installed the second one on my wife's car. Keeping track of the darn things has been a problem with my job. I'm usually nowhere near the internet. 
More often than not, I find out where they went after they've gone and disappeared. On the way home, I called Natalie Waski from Bycatch. Natalie, this is Chris Harlow. Do you have a couple minutes for me? Of course, sir. Give me your contact information, please. Okay. What can I do for you? It's a good thing you're discreet, Natalie. I'd hate for this to become office gossip. Quite right, sir. Look, Roland could be a problem for me. I certainly don't want to put you in the uncomfortable position of being my wife's keeper. But I thought just calling me when you found out Roland would be in Princeton would be a reasonable request. Of course we could, sir. But are you sure it wouldn't create more, possibly massive problems? Absolutely not. I give you my word that I will not attack or blacken Roland's reputation, or even more so Karen's. Well, I'll probably tell his wife if anything happens between them. Just so both families are on an equal footing, so to speak. There's no point in mentioning your part in all this. If you call me from someone else's phone, your contribution will be completely invisible. Oh, great. That's exactly what I was thinking. Let me get the information you requested, and I'll get back to you. Thank you for calling Bycatch. Have a good day. When my wife arrived, I had a nice dinner on the table. She was coldly polite to me. When she retired to the bedroom after dinner to do crossword puzzles, I installed another transponder on her car. Of course, I went online, and there was a map of the area with red, hash 1 and hash 2 for each of the cars. During the day for the next week, I checked those two cars every time I passed a chain cafe with Wi-Fi. Nothing of interest. On Wednesday, Natalie called and said the shipment would be delivered tomorrow morning. Thursday morning, Janetchka left for work, and Roland drove nonstop to Bikach Industries in Princeton. At lunchtime, Roland's car stalled, but came back on an hour later. I had to do some digging, but it looks like he went to the Smoked Pig restaurant. At least when I looked for restaurants on Cottage Street, it was the only one for three blocks around. My wife likes barbecue, but that's not proof that she went with him. I didn't know for sure until Natalie called and said they'd had lunch at the Smokin' Pig for an hour, then hung up. Things had calmed down a bit in the house over the past week. That evening, Janiechka came home exactly on time, more or less as she had been. After dinner, we struck up a conversation about how was your day? In the midst of the chatter, she stated that she'd had lunch at the cafeteria, eating chicken salad with cottage cheese with a couple of other women she'd been hanging out with. What? You didn't have kebabs? I asked. She shrieked. What are you trying to say? Are you calling me a liar? What makes you think I had kebab? And what's that blob of brownish red on the pocket of your blouse? Too dark for ketchup? Too thick for wine, so... Smoked pig barbecue sauce. And you like kebabs? So where did that drip come from? Dr. Watson, has Sherlock Holmes discovered the secret? No, it's just a stain on my shirt. But her face frowned as she picked at the stain. More like a stain on your honesty. You lied about going to lunch, didn't you? You and Roland went to that barbecue joint for lunch, and you're lying about it. I'm being serious. I'm not going to let you sneaking around behind my back, drowning our marriage, damn it. What in God's name makes you think about Roland all the time? If I get a flat tire on the way home, you're going to blame it on Roland. You can't tell me who I can and can't see. I won't give you that kind of power over me. I am right, am I not? If you say no, I can call Phyllis at Bycatch and ask her, you know that. She hated Phyllis. Okay, okay, but all I did was go to lunch with him. Nothing happened, and nothing's going to happen. How did you find out? Did someone from work see us? Innocent people don't need to worry. No one gave you away. Just deductive logic. The fact that you lied to me is a very bad sign, Karen. But you're right, love. I can't make you behave. Lincoln freed the slaves. After all, we're both free to do what we want. If you really want Roland instead of me, I won't stand in your way. Frankly, given your behavior lately, if not him, then someone else at another time. Listen, you leave that damn Roland alone. And if you want me to be followed, then back off. You're wasting your money. I resent you treating me like a child, trying to tell me who I can talk to and all that. You're obsessed with Roland and trying to control me. You're sick. 
Nonsense. Out of 300 million people in this country in the five years we've known each other, Roland is the only person I've warned you about. I'm not trying to control you. I'm telling you the consequences of going down the path you're on. If you don't act like a married person and make the concessions necessary to be a married person, you won't be a married person. It's as simple as that. Look, I told you not to be alone with him, and you went to lunch with him and lied about it, so you know. Honestly, I feel bad that you did that, and I'm a little apprehensive about the future. I really don't think I'm being unreasonable. Well, you're being unreasonable. I'm not jumping into bed with him. I'm just helping him through some difficulties. Look, maybe we're too involved in this case to be impartial. Let's call your sister and ask her for her opinion on who's reasonable and who isn't. She's always on your side. Forget about her. I'm a big girl, and I know what I'm doing. I pondered for a long time. I was hurt. I felt like my wife was deliberately sticking a knife in me and I wanted revenge. If I had pictures of the two of them making love, or even pictures of my wife alone but in a context where she was with Roland, I could poison the well. Better to prepare for the worst. I stopped by the law firm and bought a divorce kit. They provided the probate kit for free. The bad news was that I would have to sell the house to pay off her share. The house had appreciated in value because of the tremendous amount of work I had put into it and the fact that real estate values in the area had skyrocketed. We had about $15,000 in savings and equity in cars, but about $150,000 of equity in the house. Karen was supposed to get half of it. And that didn't seem right since most of our income was coming from me. I had to think about it. I filled out the paperwork and slipped it into an envelope. It was easy. Along the way, I filled out a set of papers for a will. I left half of my estate to my parents and half to the Boy Scouts. I put it with my work stuff until I got the certificate. I bought a new lock for the front door, but didn't have time to install it. I poked around until I found the instructions for the garage door opener and looked up how to change the code. Nothing of interest showed up on the tracking screen the next week or the week after that. On Wednesday of the third week, the day I was in North Jersey, I walked into Panateria, which has free Wi-Fi. Logging in, I saw that Roland was on his way to Princeton that morning, but had stopped at 8.30 a.m. for 11 minutes. The location was at the I-95 freeway exit, about 10 minutes from Bicutch. It could have been anything, but right there are the Holiday Inn Express and Sleep Inn Hotels. I called the Sleep Inn and asked for Roland St. Clair. No such person was available. I dialed the Holiday Inn. When I was transferred to the room, I hung up without waiting for an answer. I excused myself to my client and headed for Princeton. At 10.30, the lobby was empty. I called the counter, and a guy came out to me wearing a badly ironed white shirt, worn shoes, and black pants that had never seen an iron. I called myself Roland St. Clair and told him I had locked myself out and forgotten my room number. He was about to rough me up when I slipped him a fan of five $20 bills. Yes, sir, I remember you, Mr. St. Clair. There was a slight rustle at the table and I winked. Here you are, Mr. St. Clair, room 114. I got up, set the clock radio so it faced the bed well, and put the hotel clock in my pocket. I checked the reception and it worked fine. I used the hotel's Wi-Fi to check where they were. Damn. It was about three miles to Roland. And here I thought they were going to have lunch first. I hopped outside, got in my car, and drove to Denny's across the street. A few minutes later, a yellow Hummer pulled into the Holiday Inn parking lot. No video reception from here. Or maybe it has a motion sensor and didn't signal. I should have read the manual more than once. I forgot if it had one or not. I gave them two minutes, drove up to the hotel and parked around the corner from room 313 so that if they looked out the window, I wouldn't be visible. Great reception. I saw absolutely everything. I saw them doing it. I turned on the computer and I was tired of watching them. It was payback time. I went home, sat down at my desk and connected to the internet. I wanted to obscure Johnny's face a little. It took me a long time to figure out what software I needed to do this, but I finally figured it out. 
I created a fake ID, an RSTC, and a disposable email address. Using the fake ID, I was able to post the video clip along with the comments. Of course, the likelihood of Janetchka ever seeing this site, unless I directed her there, is zero. The plan was for me to use some of the words and commands that Roland had applied to Janetchka. The first couple of times she might ignore it, but sooner or later she'll realize where she's heard those words before and get scared. First I'll say I saw them looking at some website. Let her harass me, and then with great reluctance, I'll agree to show her the site. That should help Roland. She got home a little late, but honestly, she looked and acted normal. Maybe even a little depressed. There was a salad on the table, chicken scallops with roasted Italian vegetables. Well, love, you had a nice day, didn't you? A worried expression appeared on her face. Well, the message you left on my cell phone was very nice to receive. But other than that, nothing out of the ordinary. I completely agree. If you still have romantic intentions, they'll have to wait until tomorrow. Ah, uh, so? Well, actually, it's the way you walk and move, kind of sluggish or perhaps lubricated. And you smell different. I can't identify the odor, something like lavender soap and some kind of musk. Did you come in for a drink? A slight blush appeared on her cheeks. No, I came home straight from work. I planned to touch and kiss her like I usually did but I felt too much disgust. I realized that what I had seen this afternoon did not suit me at all. I didn't think my feelings would change over time. I no longer looked at her with anger and contempt. I was wasting my time being around her. Why waste my time? I didn't want her back. If she thought Roland was so wonderful, let her have him. What the hell do I need her for if she doesn't need me? I began to rethink the video and my plan to shit in her bed. And if I make her believe the worst about Roland from the site, she'll dump him, okay? But then maybe try to get me back. She'll stick to me like toilet paper to the heel of your shoe. It was better for me to move on and plan accordingly. So I never mentioned the website, and as far as I knew, she hadn't seen it. I made no moves to get one last bit of entertainment that night. I just didn't care. The next morning, as soon as she was out the door, I called messengers to pick up the divorce papers and deliver them at 4 p.m. to my wife's work. I went to the bank. I moved some money around in my savings and brokerage accounts to split 50-50. She was at work by this time, so I closed all of our joint credit cards. Upon returning home, I changed the lock on the front door. The clothes she usually wore to work, I packed neatly into a suitcase. All the other clothes from her closet I packed in heavy garbage bags. I logged on. The Hummer was in Wilmington, and my wife's car was at work. I didn't bother emptying her dresser. I wrapped rope around it to keep the drawers from falling out and used a two-wheeled dolly to haul it to the car. I almost killed myself dragging it onto the trunk. I filled the car with trash bags. I remembered the garage door opener and just unplugged it. Locking the front door, I drove to her mother's cottage. Her mom was stunned. I asked her not to call her daughter until 3 p.m., as I had a lot more stuff to move. On the second trip, I got the bed and mattress into the car, loaded the bedding, nightstand, and a few more bags of stuff into the trunk. I went back one last time and packed her CDs and stuff, two boxes of knickknacks and books. I looked like a modern-day refugee from the dusty thicket, traveling slowly to her mother's house. Her mom remarked, I like the idea of her living in the garage. That way she'll know it's temporary. In four or five months, it's going to be freaking cold in there. That will give her incentive to move in. I've always liked you, Chris. Isn't it unreasonable to ask you to stay in touch? Grace, I'll be happy to keep in touch, especially if it means a home-cooked dinner every now and then. I made the bed, plugged in the lamp and alarm clock. I even made the bed. What a nice guy I am. At 3.10, I had a beer with her mom while she called Karen at the office. Karen, I just wanted to tell you that Chris kicked you out, and I have to take you in for a while. Chris brought almost all of your stuff over and stacked it in the garage. I don't know what you were thinking, you silly fool. And hung up. Is this really the end, Chris? 
You two seemed very happy. What really happened? I told her some of the details, but not in great detail. Yes, pretty much the end of our marriage. Your daughter apparently hasn't yet realized what marriage is and what our mutual responsibilities are. I don't think she's ready for that. Maybe she will be ready by the time she remarries. I must admit there is little hope for that. We'll see. Back at my house, I called Roland's wife and told her what was up. She told me to butt out and mind my own business. I again pointed out that it was my business since he was entertaining my ex-wife, but she didn't thank me. Oh well, you can't please some people. I wrote a good letter, I thought. Karen, you were right. It's very nice of you to work with Roland to overcome his family problems, whatever they may be. It's important to you and important to him, but not so important to me. I want you to be happy, so as promised, I'm releasing you from our marriage. You will be able to devote all your time to Roland and many others who will undoubtedly take his place as he has taken mine. I do not know what you seek in this life, but as I think back on our time together, I am relieved to realize that your future has nothing to do with me. Know that I will not speak ill of you and will be courteous to you any time we meet. May you find peace and joy in this life. Chris and I went back to her mom's house and dumped the last of the plastic bags in the garage. I put the letter in a sealed envelope and placed it on the bed. After saying goodbye and kissing her mom, I headed back home. Arriving in our neighborhood, I parked two blocks from our house. Karen or Roland might want revenge, and I would try to get the car out of sight. I walked out onto the street behind our house and through Mrs. Corbin's yard, which adjoined our house. I unlocked the back door and went inside. Peeked out. Karen wasn't there yet. I checked the computer. Roland's truck was parked outside his house in Wilmington. Karen was just leaving work. I assumed she hadn't gotten her mother's message. I changed the answering machine, informing her that she was no longer available at this number blah blah. Too kind. I erased it and recorded a new message. Karen no longer lived here. I included her cell phone number so people could track her down. I'll save you the gnashing of teeth, cell phone calls, and Karen knocking on the door. At first, she denied doing anything with Roland other than talking. By the end of the week, she admitted, got carried away once so it wouldn't happen again. Good thing I didn't have to tell her about the videotape. On Friday, her mother called and asked if I would meet Karen at her house on Saturday. I said yes. I have to thank Literatica for the idea that saved me a lot of money. I wrote a contract stating that in the future, if one of us cheated on the other and there was enough evidence of cheating to convince a justice of the peace, the cheating partner would leave the marriage with only $10,000. I intentionally made the wording somewhat crude and scheduled another meeting with Bert, my attorney. I showed him the agreement. Bert, the agreement needs to be written roughly. I want to lull her into signing what she might consider a private agreement. I want you to reread it and, where necessary, change it so that it's a binding, airtight contract, hopefully without changing the amateurish tone of the writing. He reread it again. I suppose I should fiddle with it a lot to maximize the fee, but that will do. I've drafted a few prenuptial agreements, but never a marriage contract. This is a bit unusual. You need two copies, one for each and they have to be witnessed and dated by someone. Would her mother qualify? Legally, yes, but will she attest her signature later in court? Why take the risk? Better get someone else in who doesn't have any claims. The fee was modest, and the trap was set. The two of us met at her mom's place. She was dressed quite seductively, barefoot, in a summer dress and no underwear as far as I could tell. Karen, did I get the time wrong? I thought your mom said 12.30. No, you're right on time. Why would you think otherwise? Well, since you're dressed like that, I thought maybe Raleigh would stop by. I haven't seen Roland in a long time, and I don't intend to anymore. I dress like this for you. Chris, I really screwed up, didn't I? What day was it? Huh? You said I hadn't seen him in a while, so I asked what day you meant. The day before you kicked me out. Oh, I'm sorry. You had no reason to stop seeing him. He's your friend after all, 
and a friend in need is really a friend, whatever that means. Well, I think you were right about his marital problems. You see, he... Stop. Don't you remember? Raleigh doesn't want you talking to me about his marital problems. It's confidential, after all. And after you helped Raleigh and Sandra get back together, I can't imagine you blabbing now. Honestly. Admittedly, I guessed you were helping Raleigh overcome erectile dysfunction, and at his age that's not necessary anymore, is it? I hope your work has helped them both. Okay, maybe I deserve it, but please spare me the sarcasm. I admit I really was a fool, but I love you. I really hope you find it in your heart to forgive me, but I don't see how that's possible. You must hate me. I wish I could continue this conversation, but it's 12.15 and my stomach is demanding food. Change into street clothes and we'll go to the pub. In the car, I reduced the conversation to small talk. We sat in the back cabin alone. So I hate you, you asked. Of course you don't. I try very hard not to hate anyone. Not you, not Raleigh, not corrupt politicians. Hate is too corrosive for the one who wears it. In order not to hate you, I must forgive you, and I have. She looked at him in surprise, and his sniffling stopped. That's even worse. If you'd really acted like a fool this time, I guess I could get over it eventually, but I've thought about it a lot. I think the real problem is that you're an immature fool. I've given you plenty of opportunities to look at what you're doing, but you just didn't see it. I don't blame you for that. You are like that, at least at this stage of your life. Since it's not your fault, I forgive you easily. I suppose there's a chance you'll get wiser as you get older, but I don't want to stand by and wait for that to happen. Look, you're great at a lot of things, but you're completely clueless about a lot of other things that I appreciate, and I don't put up with fools. Chris, believe me, I've matured very quickly in the last few weeks. I think we can make our marriage work, and I'll do anything to make it work. What do you think we should do? Well, I've been thinking about it. I trusted you unconditionally, and that trust has turned out to be completely misplaced. One of your virtues is that you empathize with people. It's almost like Mother Teresa, only with a different calling. Think what a tragedy it would be if someone's grandfather married her and she ended up a housewife in Peoria. All those people in India with no one to help them. Mother Teresa was born in Peoria? I never knew that. Is that true? I was speaking metaphorically. She was born in Macedonia. Anyway, that's how I feel about marrying you and limiting you, limiting you, limiting you. I mean, if someone's feeling bad, low self-esteem, rotten wife, impotence, I can spend a little time chatting to them. I'll tell them a joke of the day to make them laugh or give them a couple bucks, but that's it. How much will that help them? Almost nothing. But you. My God, you're literally going all the way with them, trying to really help them. It would be wrong of me to interfere with such a calling. Roland and no doubt many others would have been left to find their way alone. There were no others. Only once with Roland and... Oh, that is true humility. A rich man who has a lot to give gives millions to charity. But when asked, modestly replies, Oh, I just help where I can. True, you are too modest, but I understand. Modesty is also a virtue. I didn't want to make it too easy for her. Chris, I really do understand the dirt I've turned all of this into. I've grown up a lot. I really have. Let me think about it, Karen. It all comes down to whether I want to risk wasting years of my life on you or move on. Why don't we meet tomorrow, say here, at 12.30? Sure, sure. D-12.30? She was waiting for me when I walked through the door at 12.35. I don't know how long she was there, but her beer glass was only one-three full. As before, we made small talk. I didn't bother to ask her if her mom's garage was starting to feel cozy and homey. Okay, here's what I'm thinking. The way I see it, if you slip once, you run the risk of doing it again. If I have to go through the agony of my wife having fun with anyone, I want to be compensated for it. So here's a proposition. If I catch you having fun and I can prove it to a justice of the peace, you walk out the door with 10000 and I get the rest. It's only fair that I offer you the same deal. It punishes the adulterer. If we both sign this agreement, we'll bury the hatchet and move on with our lives. 
I handed her the amateurish agreement, modeled with irrelevant typos. As I expected, she read it cursorily and said, Good, that's fair. I can sign it. I really appreciate you being so lenient. I'm not sure I could have been in your shoes. Let's hope none of us are in my shoes in the future. Dante, could you come here for a moment? The host, a casual acquaintance of ours, came right over. Ah, Chris, Karen, is there a problem? New help in the kitchen is always trouble for me. Not at all, Dante. Karen and I are signing an agreement between us, and we need someone to witness the signatures. Could you do that for us? You won't have to read the documents because you'll only witness the signature. Sure, Dante will do it for his friends. It was over in a minute. Karen and I each had a signed and witnessed legal document. A second honeymoon followed, with vows of fidelity and love and things like that. But she was stubborn, and I suspected her affair wasn't over yet. On Monday, I returned to the motel. The same clerk was in attendance. Troy, can I have a word with you? Sure. Listen, when someone makes a reservation for Roland St. Clair, give him the same number as last time, number 114, and here's something for your trouble. Well, I don't know. Rocket scientists are rarely reference. Look, you have to assign the client a room. He's stayed in this room before and presumably he likes it, so isn't it reasonable to give him a room he likes? One that he's familiar with? If someone asks and he doesn't, that's just good customer service. Of course, if the customer asks for some other room, fine. By all means, give them that room. Well, okay. And he tucked the money away in his pocket. At 9 o'clock on Thursday, I got a phone call. The accountant is back. And Natalie hung up. I wasn't working that day, so I looked into the tracking program. Sure enough, Roland had stopped at a motel that morning on his way to Princeton. At 11.45, my phone rang again. Trouble in paradise. She said she won't be back today. A few minutes later, the phone rang again. Your buddy says hi to all of us until next time and is out the door. Good luck, Cree. I hope things aren't as they seem. I checked the tracking. They were heading toward the motel, but stopped at a steakhouse. Good. Plenty of time. I sat in the parking lot across from the motel and ate a delicious sandwich from the deli. I brushed off the crumbs and was sipping my coffee when cars pulled into the parking lot. They parked right in front of license plate 114. I snapped a few pictures of them hugging each other near their cars and then walking to the motel room door with their hands in each other's hip pockets. After a minute or two, I pulled into the parking lot and out of sight. My computer began recording the scene as I crossed the street. The dialogue was different than before, but the actions were about the same. Here's the contract Chris wrote. It was embarrassing. He asked me to sign it right at that awful pub he likes, the Jolly Big Pub on Main. The creepy type who owns it, Dante something something, was a witness. I mean, who would write such an amateurish thing, you know? It sounds stupid, but Roland, this is the last time, at least for a while. I don't want him to find out, not that he will, but he found out once so maybe again. That wouldn't be good. Karen, just listen. My God, is that a contract? It's like totally folksy, and spell check doesn't work. It would be laughed at in court. Forget it. It's just Perry Mason's dream. Who's Perry Mason? He was a lawyer on a TV show, a pompous ass. In that super serious way, he had people confess to God knows what on the witness stand. It's totally unbelievable. Forget about last Sunday, come here. Nonsense, Karen. You said it last time. I need you. You need me. Don't you like what we do together? With me, you can ask for anything, do anything, and we do it. Look. Next, I saw them doing this. I pondered what to do next. Eventually, I pulled up to their room, got out of the car, and stood next to the door. My digital camera could record about five minutes of conversation, and I didn't have to wait long. I turned the camera on when I heard one of them slide the chain off the latch. Karen came trotting out, calling over her shoulder. Okay, Raleigh, same time next week. You can entertain him tomorrow if you want. Eek. Damn, you got scared. What are you doing here? 
Oh my God. I'm doing the same thing you're doing. Witnessing the end of our marriage. Don't bother going home. You don't have one. I've changed the lock. I'll drop off your things at your mom's. No, Chris, you can't. Oh, yes, I can. I've already gone the extra mile and fooled you even more. You just got excited about a $100,000 nooner. I get the house and our investment, and you only get $10,000, but I guess you realize that. Chris, you're a goddamn son of a bitch. You can't do that. There was no point in sticking around and gloating. As I was opening my car door, Roland's head peeked out from behind the door. Raleigh, I hope Karen's particular style of marriage counseling worked out for you and Grace. Don't forget to take them to the Flyers game. She'll love it. Everyone goes there for the fights. Epilogue Everything went smoothly, despite Karen's attempts to thwart the divorce and, in spite of that, to try to get half of the assets. My wife was sly and begged, but our agreement stood. I got rid of her on my terms. I wondered what I would have done if she had taken the straight path. Would I have stayed married? If if and and were pots and pans, there would be no need for a master hand. Roland and Grace broke up. Karen tried to get a transfer to Wilmington so they could live together. Last I heard, they broke up and Karen was living in Tulsa. Good riddance. The end. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.